The next speaker is Kaspar Hoppe. Kaspar actually is a high-end um, uh, IT recruiter and he is focusing on machine learning, deep learning and computer vision roles. Um, we will handle some of his questions uh, at the end of his presentation, uh, but also during the way because he is going to fail the whole next hour. Thank you very much. Can you start with like a brief introduction about yourself? I'll be as brief as I can, but I'm going to start with uh, two So help me with two questions, please. Are you okay, Robert? Can I start? Yeah, sure. The, 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 the sound was uh, away for like two seconds, but now, now we can hear you. Okay. I hope it stays stable. I'm going to start with two questions, and I'm going to invite the people who attend this webinar to uh, type their answers in the chat, right? And I'm going to start with two questions. One is a bit of a joke, and the other one is slightly more serious. They're both jokes. What is the most important criteria to join ML6? That's question one. And question two is, which industry or sector do you think you can get an easiest way job as a data scientist in the Netherlands? So those two questions. Question one, what's the criterion? Bit of a joke for ML6. And what's the best industry or sector to easily get a job in the Netherlands in data science? Can you start typing in the chat? Can I see some more answers, please? What's the joining criterion for ML6, the best one? And what's the sector or industry that you can easily find a job in data science in the Netherlands? Great. Being James Bond, excellent. Okay, I'll start going through the answers. I think great hair is a joining criterion for ML6. Guys, you also have great hair, fantastic. That was the joke, of course, but now the sector to easily get a data science job in the Netherlands is in banking, banking systems, core banking systems, new banks, banking, financial sector. So I can truly recommend people to have a good look around there. That's the industry that recruits best, and that's where you have a good chance to get a job in data science easily. Anyways, I'm going to shift to my presentation. I've got quite a few slides. I've got three sections to my presentation. A bit of an introduction. I'll tell a bit about myself. I'm going to talk about quality of a good resume. Then we'll have a little break with some questions. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about doing a good job interview. Then we'll have another break with some questions. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about landing the job. You know, what do you have to do at the end and some negotiation. Will, uh, be discussed as well. But first, I'll start introducing myself properly. Just a second. Share screen. And that was my opening question. Hmm. Just a second, please. I want to see if it shifts to the next page. Yes, that's great. Okay, good. As you heard in the introduction, um, I run an agency, a headhunt agency, been around for a couple of years. I specialize in supplying resources to AI engineers to R&D departments, specialized in deep learning, machine learning, computer vision, data science, data engineering, advanced analytics. And I've got a few presences across Europe. I've got a good presence in the Netherlands, in France, learning a lot about Germany at the moment as well. And my footprint in the Netherlands out of the agency came with starting the autonomous driving unit and HD mapping unit for a large economy, uh, company in autonomous driving in Amsterdam, and also based in, in Eindhoven. I started that group with a couple of key people that came out of uh, VR. Now, the other sectors that I work in successfully besides autonomous driving, where I work with many companies now, is in medtech, uh, in financial services, and also in AI for customer service. So I want to 
find out what's happening, what are the kind of players if as a job seeker you're trying to find a job as a data scientist. There's quite a world out there, as you probably know, and there's quite a few players. Now, I position myself as a headhunter, um, and that is an external role to a potential employer. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see the parties involved with hiring within the company, like an internal recruiter and the hiring manager. There are usually also external parties in, um, included in some of the search and supplying and completing job offers, of which I'm the headhunter. I do that based, and the arrow is a little bit the wrong way around. I do that based on a request from a hiring manager. So a hiring manager asks me, listen, I have this vacancy. We need some support in getting the right resources or suggestions. Can you help us supply those? Then I start looking around, of course, first of all, in my own database, but I also start searching custom, some candidates to start supplying shortlists. And if I'm lucky, I get interviews out of those shortlists. So what is, what is a headhunter and why would a company use a headhunter? Well, in many cases, a CTO is very specific about what he or she wants, uh, but he has other things to do and he can't get it done. And on top of that, when he tries to deal or she does deal with internal recruiters, they realize that they need specialized services. They need people who are in the market for a while because internal recruiters, fantastic people, but they have to shift their role many times. So just when they're getting ready, just when they're starting to understand data science, they're asked to rotate to, for example, internally start recruiting for finance specialists. So that's the difference between an internal recruiter and a headhunter. A headhunter is able to specialize completely on a certain area and react to a demand on a specialized request. So we work together with the hiring manager. And that means that we have direct access to the source of information on what's needed. You know, what are you specifically looking for? We can fine tune it a bit, get some feedback because we have a direct line with the hiring manager. And sometimes things get stuck, of course, in the hiring process. You don't hear it, you wanna follow it up, things are happening. I can make a brief phone call to someone and say, can you please push this through because you want to talk to this and this person. So you have a bit of an internal position together with the hiring managers to get things done. Now, how does the model work? It's quite easy. I'm a middleman, so only one person can pay me. The employer pays me, meaning your future employer can pay me, pays me a commission based on a successful payment, uh, a successful placement. Candidates don't pay a penny. And yet I represent the candidates to get things done. I need to land you the job that you feel happy about that you're going to sign up with. So in the end, that also makes me different from a recruiter because I need to get people signed up. That's end-to-end -end recruitment. It's only done, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. Only when a person is sitting on a chair in the company, I get my commission. I even can be forced to pay a commission back if a candidate leaves within, let's say, two months after starting. So I know a lot about the negotiation to get the deal done in the end as well. I'm gonna talk about that later on. And a recruitment agency is generally not the same as a headhunter. Where are recruitment agencies good? They are what I call the volume fitters. They, they get a lot of offering to a potential employer and they work more on numbers. And as such, and I'm sure they wouldn't take this as a compliment, let, but let's say they source more candidates to a potential employer. So, as I said in the first section, we're going to talk about a resume, a CV, how to get a good CV to land yourself a nice job as a data scientist. And let's get rid of some overall pain points for candidates. And I know your pain about rewriting a resume. Isn't it a pain to rewrite your resume so many times? And yes, that's totally true. So I'm aware that if I speak to candidates and while working with them, I ask them or I suggest them to make changes, it's a very tiring process. They've gone through it many times. It's something you wanna put away at some point and just send out. Um, and I keep on bringing these propositions to change it. Well, sorry about that. You know, People can take on board these recommendations and change their resume. I've actually stopped waiting until someone has made those changes. I just use the version that they have simply because they're just recommendations that people can take on board. So also take my recommendations from today like that. 
And as people say, every time I show my resume to someone else, there's a different opinion, you know, different format, different tips. Absolutely true. But I can make one core recommendation. Always have it reviewed because you'll see you always find a mistake or an unclarity. And I'll, I'll give you a little tip. If a data scientist has little interpunction mistakes on a resume, you know, space comma instead of comma space and that a few times all over the resume, that's a bad sign to a hiring manager. If the person already has mistakes on his resume, how is he or she going to do when we're actually going to do some data science? So please be meticulous in scanning, rescanning your resume. Tip one. Then the question is, you know, I'm trying to get a resume in one page. It must be on one page, right? Everyone says it must be on page, on one page. And I say, no, there's no rule. Of course, it's great to get a resume in one page, but that's not the golden rule. And actually the risk that you have when you try to push it all on one resume is that you start losing some detail and your resume becomes too generic and too interchangeable. However, going beyond three pages, uh, I can scan through them quite quickly with my brain is going, no, not good. If I bring this to a client, this client will just die bored and trying to read it. So three pages is truly the maximum. One of the other risks that you see is people are trying to be complete in their resume. If I give that detail in my latest job, I must also give the same detail in the job that I did five years ago. Please just make it one line saying this is what I did five years ago. Simple question, very easy to answer. Do I put a photo of my lovely face on the resume? <clears throat> and the answer is clearly yes. And I know there's discussion about it, and I know it sounds ridiculous, but actually it's not. I truly recommend to put a picture on there because you want to connect with a person as an interviewer. You want to see who you have in front. Instead of a piece of paper, you want to say, I want to speak to that person. Especially when you have lovely hair, of course, you should put it on the picture. Good. Next topic. I know there's quite a few of nationalities in the audience. And I see a lot of resumes. <clears throat> and you can see quite a few flows when it comes to styles and formats and tones. And I, I know how to recognize them, quite simple, right? Um, I get a lot of good candidates from India, and they're very strong at stating, I was in the top percentages. My university has this ranking. I am in the top percentile of the people you want to speak with. Uh, great. Don't forget that in other countries, people might read past that. I will also say it's important. There are so many great universities in India. When it comes to the top ranking, your country is fantastic, especially compared to other countries. So I know you want to stress it, but then try to make it clear in a different way. When you read a French resume, it's full of abbreviations, you know, acronyms, abbreviations, where you go like, what is that? Even the name of the university, I've never heard of it. And it seems that only the French understand it. That's a bit of a problem. But again, engineering universities in France are good, the top level, many have two degrees even, and it's worthwhile to look into it. Not many clients do that. They are so confused by these acronyms, they don't dare looking into what it actually means, and they miss out on good engineers. Now comes the typical Dutch resume. On the Dutch resume, it says, I was befriended with Professor Max Welling. I'm, I washed his car. Anything to say that you have a relationship to a good supervisor or a professor is being flaunted, is being shown and explained. So it's very important in the Netherlands to show that you're in the night, the right network, that you've spoken to the right people, that they appreciate you and you put that on your resume. And American resumes, well, I have to put on my reading glasses because it's a boom spaghetti all kinds of detail on one page, so many words, so many things, it's just like overblowing. There's many details on value. What did I create? What was created as value within the company? But I think the most, remote, most important remark is, don't worry about the format. You know, if you come across a recruiter that actually is, you know, like not appreciating that and getting too much you know, uh, giving too much attention to the format being used, that's not a good recruiter. Good recruiters can read past these cultural types of resumes. They can read through it and they can find the right detail and they can ask the right questions to get behind it.
Just a second. I need to check my order in the pages. There I am. Okay, good. I'm going to talk a little bit about the content, of course. Now, there's one important choice to make. When you give content on a resume, never write it for a generic person. Write it for the experienced hiring manager that you want to work for, for your future boss. Because if things go well and your resume is good, that's the resume that will land on a hiring manager's desk. So don't try to explain context, uh, context like I made a joke, like don't write it for your mother-in-law trying to explain what data science is. Don't try to like explain it to in-house recruiters. Try to write it for the experienced hiring manager, the person who, if you're at a conference on data science, he or she will be next to you attending these conferences as well and understanding what's discussed. So you need to be specific. You need to show yourself as a specialist. And I'll come back later a bit about how you do that when you don't have that experience yet. But make sure that your resume is written for a hiring manager. Now, how do you do that? Um, and this is a very important word that I put in there in bold. Uh, if you write it, and if you try to put that on one page or two pages, you must include something that's called undeniable details. And what are undeniable details? It's quite simple. Those are the details on a resume that you experienced when you did a project or you did a little research work, and only a person who really did it knows those details. And that will be recognized by your future boss, going like, this person can only know that if he or she did it, right? Now, why is that important? Because it will make you stand out from your generic resumes, where there are many that are comparable and are just the same. You need to show that you've done it. You can do that in describing a little project, like a little description of a project that you did. And it's not on the page here, but I'll tell you, 90% of my resumes that I have a look at when they come to describing the IT skills, they just give the standard list. R, SQL, just, it's just that little sum up. And that is such a waste because I'm sure you worked with it. I'm sure you understand it. Could you please give a little bit of detail that proves that you know more about it and just naming it? What version have you used? Was it modern C++? What have you come across? Was there a little problem with it? Was there a conflict? What libraries provide more details? And you'll see that you'll stand out from the 90% of the people that just list the IT skills. Even naming the version number of what you use makes a big difference already. And this is not a joke. I literally had a hiring manager from the company that I spoke about before where I did that deep learning unit literally called me one day and said, Casper, this is the first resume where I actually get a version number on Python and on C++. Fantastic. I want to speak to this person. It's that extreme sometimes that people stick to giving just a generic list without showing to know a little bit more about that. So that's about the hard skills. You know, that's enough challenge already, but believe me, it's important. Now becomes, now I get into a more slightly more different topic because I deal a lot with graduates as well and you know, it's a bit of a dilemma there. Um, how do you choose a domain or an industry? That's fine. Again, Before we move to, to this second part or this other related topic, can I ask you a few questions? Go for it. Um, so you can breathe a little bit <laughs> maybe. Um, so there are a few questions actually about having a photo in your resume. Um, someone says, well, uh, a resume is only scanned for like five seconds or seven seconds. Mm, does it make sense to, to include a, a photo anyway? And another related question is, does, is it not something that biases the whole process because someone or a recruiter is looking at, at, at the picture, of course, at the photo and already have some feeling or idea about the candidate? What can you tell, what can you tell us about this? I'm ugly, I got jobs. So <laughs> I think to settle the last one, that's really not what it's about. And I think biased, you know, speaks out of fear. You know, am I confident enough just to put a nice little picture on it? Well, if you're confident enough to put it on WhatsApp, why not put it on a resume? But let's come back to the main point. It is about you want to hire a person, right? And, and, and that is the simple difference that you make with the photo. So I was smiling a bit when that question came up, you know, came up. Of course, it's always disputed. People don't do it, people do it. Literally, I, you know, 
it won't make a, a hell of a difference, but I can say, why not? You know, why not? You want to interview a person and you want to recognize a person. And that bias, why? If you're smiling, then then that's what it is. It's, it's a, if it's a friendly, friendly picture, you just want to recruit a person and not a machine. You want to yeah. be able to spend lunch with the person and you don't do that with a machine or with a resume. So also it doesn't matter if someone doesn't have a picture, it doesn't, you don't take any conclusions from this. No, you don't make conclusions out of it, but don't get me wrong, you really want to have fun during an interview as well, right? So if you can make it more personal and not make it dreadful an interview, it, it can be fun. It's, you know, interviewers do a lot of inter interviews as part of their job, but they also want it to be a bit of fun and to get a bit of energy out of it. So the more interaction you can get going, and that can be personal interaction as well, I can recommend that. Is it scary? That's the question, I think. Is it scary to show a little bit of yourself, a little bit more of yourself? Of course it is scary, but there are good sales books. Don't forget, I work for large companies like Ronstadt, where it's all about sales, sales, sales. It's also a hook. You know, it's a hook to sell yourself into a company. And you right, and they will see you anyway if they invite you for the interview, of course. True, true, but uh, that's a big barrier, Robert. You know, when it comes to the numbers of people, I'm glad you mentioned this. This is a true important question. The number of resumes that I get and that I look through and the number of invitations for our first interviews, that's the first big barrier. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. So you can do many doubts before. Shall I do a picture or not? If it makes it easier to get yourself selected for a first interview, believe me, just do it. No. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we have another question, which is uh, an interesting question, I think. Do you use machine learning um, for like evaluation in the recruitment process or evaluation of the resume. It's in your head. There's the machine. Learning. Absolutely. No, I, you know, I, there are two different parts and I come back to the start of my presentation There's recruitment agencies, you know, there's recruitment tools, there's a headhunter. I need to have that collection and that specific connection with the person. So I read through all my resumes by hand, by head, right? So there's no tooling for me. Um, I, I actually can also say that the, let's call it the storage value of a resume is low. So all machines lovingly storing data for paid future use, mm, you know, a person stays relevant during his availability period. So that's when I read it. And after a while, I'll put it aside. Maybe I pick up on it again, year, year and a half later to get some information from a person or to find out whether he or she is available and that's it. So no, I don't use that myself. No, mm -hmm. I understand. I understand. Okay, final uh, question before you can uh, continue. Um, someone is asking Keen actually, how do you recognize a good recruiting agency? That's kind of diff difficult if you go just Googling around. Oh, you mean how you recognize how you find one as a candidate? Yes, right. Uh, -huh. uh good, good, good. Uh, it depends on the level of experience that you have. So you can trust that when you're a graduate, just pump it into the larger volume companies. You know, I mentioned one already, Ronstadt, you know, in the Netherlands or Yeah, or any of the larger companies and they supply, they are sourcers. So one of the bigger names, Michael Page, I can name all of them, fantastic companies. Just make your details known with them. Just send it out. They actually will pick it up. They need material constantly to provide to companies and they will send your resume out. If you have more experience, a couple of more years on the clock, there's a better chance with a specialized headhunter. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Just continue with your presentation. Great, thank you. Can the slides still be seen, by the way, now? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, so I was, I was getting to that you know, slightly more important topic about, uh, you know, I talked about getting undeniable details on your resume, and I also said, make a choice about your domain or industry. And people get very confused. What is a domain? What is an industry? What is a sector? What do you mean? Well, it's quite easy, actually. I mean, stuff like banking, financial services, medical, automotive, even academic research, of course, is a sector in itself. So all I'm trying to do is saying to people, try to be specific. You must stand out. And generic choices on your resume will not make you stand out. I can exchange you for any other candidate. Also, choosing for an industry means that you have an intrinsic uh, motivation to work for a certain industry or a company. Sometimes I do this little teasing question asking, what did your parents do as a job? Because you'll see there's a little extra you know, motivation for a person to talk about a specific sector or industry. 
I'm almost through when it comes to the resume tips, but I'll deal with a few dilemmas, things that are not that easily to solve when it comes to just shifting your format or presenting yourself with a smile. Um, and I was hoping to use maybe the chat to get one of the questions lifted out of here. Just let me know if you have a specific one that you want to know more about. Uh, but one of these dilemmas is, and I think it comes across uh, many times, I don't have a lot of work experience yet. Will I get selected for a first interview and how do I give the impression that I do have some work experience? That's an important one. Well, I'll give an easy answer. Is you can't do everything, of course, to change that except be clever. And a lot of people underestimate that the first couple of lines that a recruiter or a headhunter or a hiring manager reads on a resume are the ones that stick in his or her mind. So if you start your resume by saying, because you're all proud, you just finished your studies, I just recently graduated from University X, let's say Salon, the rest of the resume will be read as he or she is a graduate. If you're clever enough to say, I just finished a project on NLP and it greatly motivated me because now I know X, Y, Z. By the way, you know, I am a recent graduate from Saarland. You will see it gives a different impression. So don't forget that the first things that you write down determine what people have in their mind about what you are. Are you a recent graduate? Do you have experience? I never worked in the desired geographical region before. And I think I saw a question in the, in the chat. You know, I'm in, uh, were you in India and maybe you want to work in Europe? Yes, that's a bit of a challenge. But don't forget, there are companies that actually look for you specifically because they have specialized in getting new employees straight away from a different country or a different region. <clears throat> And I know you can't really know that. Who is this company? What company does that? Um, but this is maybe where a recruitment agency or a headhunter can work. So don't forget, sometimes people are really looking, specifically looking for new employees from another country or another geographical region. What also helps, and this is actually a perfect combination, let's say you're from India, you've done, you've done your master's in, there it is again, Saarland, Max Planck, that's a great combination because then hiring managers kind of know skills are there. You know, we like the profile and this person is also a little bit accustomed already to being in Europe. So that's a good combination of skills. So if you're thinking about doing a master's after your bachelor's and you're in a different geographical region, why don't you step over for your master's to a totally different region where you want to work after that? <clears throat> Next question. I feel categorized the country according to the country that I come from. And I can be pretty straightforward. When I get this question, it always surprises me. Because the answer to that is no, you will not be categorized according to the country that you come from. And there are so many differences in experience between recruiters or whether they have they've just started in the market, or whether they're there a couple of years, whether the hiring manager knows exactly what he wants, or the hiring manager is just a starter. Well, let me say, if you're being judged on the country that you come from, instead of the experience that you have, you don't want to work for that hiring manager. You want to work for the hiring manager that knows that it doesn't matter which region you come from. So the answer to that is no. Next dilemma, not an importance. I don't have a local work visa yet. So am I attractive enough, attractive enough to work in a certain country? Hmm. Not an easy question, of course, but I'll give a few tips there. Um, there are a few European countries, quite a few, that have an active policy, of course, in getting knowledge migrants into their country. The only problem is that per country, these rulings are different. Now, I happen to know a little bit more about the rules in the Netherlands because I'm part of something which is called the Innovation Attaché Network, which is part of the Foreign Affairs Office, where they try to stimulate innovation and they have attachés in every country and they are very aware of the local policies. And through that network, I know a lot about it. And I wanna point out, for example, one tip. In general, the work visa depends on your employer. You know, if your employer is willing to give a contract, that's where you get the work visa. There is a few workarounds, and I want to name one specifically. 
if you studied in the Netherlands and you're non-EU, for example, you get an orientation year, you get to stay around to find a job for quite a long time. We want to retain our talent that we put on education programs in the Netherlands and often a good time to find new jobs. But there is also such a program for top 200 universities from any country. So if you're in the QS list for top universities, 200 or the times list, or your faculty is in there, you can apply in the Netherlands for something called Orientatiejaar. And for that, you don't need an employer's visa. Of course, it's quite strict. You need to be from a specific group, but it actually allows you, if you're from this university, to take the step yourself to apply for this. It's not even expensive and allowing you to enter into a country with the appropriate uh, visa to work for an employer. Last tip on that, there is a list from the immigration service in the Netherlands called IND, e and -A. And on that list, it actually mentions all employers that are allowed to employ non-EU uh, knowledge migrants. And it's an extensive list, exhaustive list. So you can even use that list from the IND of employers that are allowed to get non-EU people on board as your trigger list to say, oh, what's this company? Oh, what's this company? What do they do? Let me send my resume to them. So there's workarounds for this visa situation. Last question on this page, and I think there's some more points after this about the visa, uh, sorry, about the uh, resume. That complaint about, listen, I've sent my resume and I haven't had an update. Very annoying. Very, very sorry about this, but this happens in the process. You cannot imagine how complex it is to actually update all the candidates in a procedure about where they are. On top of that, sometimes an employer just simply wants to keep you on board without sending you away saying, we didn't select you. So I'm very sorry about this process, but don't get annoyed by it or try not to get annoyed by it. And it really doesn't help constantly asking for a status update. So this just happens in the business, I'm sorry. My little COVID page when it comes to resume and hiring. What's the status when it comes to COVID and hiring? No surprise, the hiring numbers have been down. But don't forget, recruitment is a very cyclical business. You know, in September, sorry, in December, it goes down anyways, because people are trying to close down their books in a positive way. There is a good positive vibe at the end of January again. It's all very sensitive to movement, to positive movement around in the market. There is a tide against the graduates why uh, people have asked about remote working already if you get a graduate to join at the moment or you have the choice to get someone a little bit more experienced on board at the moment through the situation with remote working because of COVID it is easier to get someone on board and to get this, someone to start quickly that is not a starter uh, so it's worked against graduates and I have noted that is this, this is quite a structural change because of COVID so what's the workaround with that? Again, it's a resume trick. You must show that even if you start rem working remotely with a company, you know how it works. You know how to get your information. You've done that before in a project. You knew how to start. I can hit the ground running. And if you are going to make it very concrete, just say it in your interest, in your initial profile, just say, I know how to hit the ground running, even in a remote way. So those are my remarks when it comes to resume. The first part of the presentation, I'll skip to the interview next, but maybe this is a good time to get some questions about resumes. Yes, Kasper. some people are asking questions about, uh, well, they have gaps in their resume. Um, for example, someone has been ill for a certain period and he does not have a lot of relative work experience yet. What would you, would you give any, any tips what to do with your, 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 your resume or how to, to yeah. fill these gaps or be, just be honest? Oh, good. good that you bring me there. Um, I think it's in American, it's called fibbing it, you know, like faking it. Um, and we have these little hairs everywhere on our body where we can intuitively sense that there's something wrong if people are trying to hide things don't underestimate this intuition people know it quite quickly so 
although you think you're hiding it or you know maybe they won't see it they will feel it uh, so intuitively a recruiter is actually and hiring managers like anyone is very good at you know reading underlying messages so no i'll be very clear about that um and gaps no not nice on a resume unfinished studies you know also not very good on a resume start explaining why you know and, and otherwise you'll just be filtered out so i know there's a quite an extreme example of someone being ill but people are humans people understand that after a period where you've been ill you also deserve a break so i can work with you and not against you sometimes right and what about if you switched jobs a lot like every year for five years in a row Start working as a contractor or a freelancer. Um, no. Um, why? Just mention it all, or no? Those are those are job hoppers. I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, it's quite simple, and this is the HR view and the hiring manager's view. There is an investment taking place in people, and this investment takes some time. And the worst thing that happens to a hiring manager after all this intensive process is that a person leaves again after six months or a year or whatever job offers. And that's a total disinvestment. So no, they will not like that. And it actually wasn't a joke when I made that remark about are you a freelancer or a contractor? Maybe you're better off in a freelancer or a contractor world if you like job hopping and if you want that shifting in environments. You know, it's also great but then become a contractor. It's a different mindset. It's not necessarily a negative mindset, but when it comes to full-time employment in R&D, AI, data science, they will invest in you and they will not like it if you, you're being used as a stepping stone to a better job in no time. Right. Okay, and a, a very uh, different question. Someone is asking, well, you have like the, I don't know how you pronounce it, MOOC, so like some uh, massive oh, yeah. courses. Mm -hmm. How do you rate this and how do you compare it with like company uh, course, like Google and IBM, they have like their own like courses which are available for everyone. How do you rate this or compare this to each other? Not one answer possible to this question. And, and I'll name two extreme examples. I have a hiring manager, you know, who's very much on the conferences and the publications and the journals. And if he sees a resume that has so many moves on them, he will just put it away. He doesn't like it. And that's his personal choice. He has a doctorate degree from a university. He goes to these conferences and that's what he likes. He literally puts them aside. And that's a specific example. I'll also tell you that I got a highly, highly specialized physics background guy who now works for a company called Microsoft in Cambridge, and he loved doing MOOCs. Every time when he wanted to learn something new, he just took it and he put it on his resume. So it, it, there's not one tell all answer about it. Um, I think the main thing to stress is the university that you did or the degree that you did from your official studies. Yes, I think so too. There are a lot, of, a lot more questions for you. People uh, even want to send resumes to you, but <laughs> maybe when you are done with your presentation in like yeah. twenty minutes, you can can check the, the questions. Just always happy to get resumes. Yes. yes, just uh, continue with your great story. Great, thank you very much for that. I and questions are fine. You know, happy guys to help out with these. Regard this as an internal talk. I'm happy to give any tips or tricks or trade from uh, this business. So. Happy to see them. And the next slide with questions. I'm shifting over to a slightly shorter part during the interview. Why is it shorter? Guys, this is your magic. As soon as a recruiter or a headhunter has managed to get you over that first hump, you know, an invitation to do a talk, it's all yours. But I'll give a few tips anyways. Doing the interview, you're on your own now. Scary, huh? It's a good energy, of course, huh? It's a good energy. You've done it. You can talk to a person. Just ride that wave a little bit of that, that fear. It's a good fear. Now, what I can recommend is you have a few levels of preparation. And what I would say is sometimes you get an interview where you think like, mm, am I sure I want to work in this sector or this, this thing? I didn't choose for it initially. And now I get this invitation to work for a sector where I haven't chosen to do it. 
What helps in that case is to read up on what's happening in that sector. And I was challenged about this recently and I had to look into the changes into the financial sector. And I use the legislation framework, PSD2 framework, to actually read up on it and see what has happened in the last couple of years in this industry, in this case, the banking and financial services industry. And I started reading it just on Wikipedia page about PSD2, a very controversial framework. I thought it was controversial. And I read it and I thought, wow, this framework offers so many opportunities for this whole sector to go through changes. And I even, in my head, learned the definition of PSD2. And I was willing to have a discussion about it. So my whole interest in an interview with a company in that sector raised. So look into a topic, whether it's legal, or whether it's a sector or a sector report or anything that talks about developments in that sector, you know, so that you can find some energy yourself, as in, I find this interesting, this sector. Maybe it wasn't my first choice of an interview, but at least my interest has gone up. <clears throat> Learn a few terminologies, definitions. What does data monetization mean now? What is this whole privacy topic? And, and what are the main definitions around it? Now, during the interview, we're now at the interview. Uh, this whole preparation usually takes place like one day, two days before you actually have the interview. And no, all last minute, like I did my presentation, you know, preparing it last minute. Don't go into an interview all rushed or winding yourself up, oh, you know, I did my presentation, boom, 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 your heart's going like that. No, just go out. Go out, have a walk, be chill, be good about yourself, and then start having to talk. Very simple suggestion for an interview. And now comes the most important one. Like I did a little bit myself into this presentation, I went into the content straight away, boom, 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 boom. And there was no connection that I made. Unless, of course, I made it with Robert in this way, or I made it with the guys from ML6 by making a joke about them. There is always an opportunity to make a connection with your interviewer. You must force to do that. You must teach yourself, I will not start the interview until I have some personal talk going. Hey, Casper, nice clock you have on the back on the wall there. What's that? Is that a piece of antique? This is a very, people might find it an awkward way to, to commence a conversation, but it's a way to make a connection and to relax. And if you start a talk straight away by going to my profile this, I've done this in the last four years or whatever, there is no connection made with the other person. And you must really make a challenge to create a connection. And I've written down a few examples on the slide saying, what nice plan behind you, clock, etc." You must find a way to do that. If it's too much and the interviewer thinks, okay, we've connected, nice, pleasant, now let's start the interview. The interview will tell you, the interviewer will tell you when that moment is started, right? You must find that personal connection. And this is the interview, you get your questions, you know, you try to answer as much as possible. And again, I come back to the point of showing some technical details. Even if the interviewer doesn't ask you for the technical details, you must find an opportunity to give some evidence, some proof that you've actually done it. You must go into some detail and create that moment yourself by saying, this is how I would do that. And it might be an awkward moment in the talk where the interviewer at first thinks, hey, I didn't even ask a question about that, but it's about giving that proof that you've done it and recently that you've done it. I can't, of course, tell what kind of detail that is. That depends on the question or your background. But you must go into that. Now, done that, had a few questions. Again, it's about connection. I wanted to do a bit of soft talk, but I'm also dealing with data scientists, computer vision experts, and deep learning experts. You have to round up the talk, and you have to crack a joke. Again, you have to come back to the connection. And I've heard excellent examples, positive examples, of interviewers who cracked a joke together with the candidates. Someone prepared a question about PSV, the football team in Eindhoven. And the interviewer just laughed because he came out of a, a great capital and he realized it was just a joke to 
to cover the insecurity about moving to Eindhoven, which is a great city, but it's not, you know, New York or anything. So it just gets things going in a positive way. But they're also a tactical way to show that you're ready to move to a different city. Don't forget, this is at the end where you've done your last interview and a person, the interviewer must feel that this person is ready to move to another city to set himself or herself into a new job. So making jokes about readiness, I'm ready for this in an anecdotal way is a perfect way to show that you're ready to make the move to, in this case, Eindhoven. And of course, quite cleverly, always ask for what's next. And don't forget, it's actually quite gentle to send a little message, an email to an interviewer this same evening or latest the next morning saying, thank you very much. I enjoyed that. These are my contact details. Looking forward to hearing from you next. You'll see that these kind of polite messages stick around and hiring managers mention it to me that they appreciate it. So you've done the talk. You sit back in your room and you think like, oh, it didn't go well and I didn't say the things they wanted and whatever, you know, like, don't care. Get that out of your mind. You did your best. Don't get stuck in these and just look around for the next one. I know that the people who have a very important talk, the best thing they can do is just double it up with another track of another company after they've done the important one that they really want, that they already have a backup interview running. Uh, just make yourself feel better. You've done your best. People are usually quite drained after interviews, candidates, I mean. You know, you've given a lot, you want to show your best side, boom, the whole thing collapses after the talk. That doesn't say a lot. However, if I check with candidates, did it go well? And they say, hmm, you know, this and this went well. However, there it didn't go that well. That's usually a sign that that will be picked on and maybe you don't get the best results. So you can intuitively feel whether it went really well or not. Maybe some questions about doing the interviews from the, uh, from the candidates, Robert. Yes, yes, yes. There are many questions. Um, let me see. Okay, Kasper, could you list the top uh, three to five European countries that are looking for international specialists? Well, in the field of machine learning, then, of course. Germany, Germany, Netherlands. Uh, no. Um... Well, I think it's, I think it, I can, I can only base that out of my own experience at the moment. And, and of course I present it as a joke, but I'm, I'm I work very happily together with France when it comes to their visa situation, it's a little bit more specific. Uh, Germany turns out to be easier when it comes to visa situations. There's good companies there and the Netherlands are the little brother of Germany, of course. So I named the three countries that have a nice access that are very comparable and you, Trust me, you have a good volume of opportunities if you scan these countries. Learn about the visa situation. Look up the immigration office and see if you can find something specific about it. Mm -hmm. okay, all three countries to understand it. All three have different rules, of course. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, someone, Linda Hovius, is asking, uh, or she would like to know which university degrees or diplomas are most valued by you personally? Max Planck, Uva, Leuven. I love Spanish universities. Good, you know, open, tolerant people come out of that. Welcome to other countries. Good movers as well. Italy okay. can work a lot with that, for example. When it comes to France, there's these top league engineering schools that you need to understand, ENS and, and HEC and all these abbreviations that come with it. There's quite a few, but my clients don't recognize them that quickly. So in general, I see in the Netherlands, there's a good landscape when it comes to data science and AI of all kinds of varieties of studies that you can do in all kinds of universities. It's a good mature landscape, right? So if you're thinking about the studies, where to study, I think the Netherlands offers you a good wide range of topics to do. And they are good universities as well. Of course, there's a league in there, you know, the, the natural classical ones like Delft, Uva. Ooh, where should I go? Uh, and Toven are wanted, and, and then you have a, another league after that. So 
I can name a few. And if I see Max Planck, trust me, my eyes will boom. I read that resume because they picked on the, these people. And Max Planck Institute is linked to Saarland University. There's an upcoming one in Germany called Tübingen University. You see a lot of assistant professors and professors moving there. It's ETH in Zurich. You know, if you have the money to live in southern Germany or Switzerland, you get invited there. Great university there. UPFL in Switzerland, fantastic. Istanbul, ITU, plenty of options all around, all across Europe. Okay, Kasper, you are not at the end, right, of your presentation? No. No, but we have like five minutes left for presentation and then we can, can answer a few more questions. So, Mind if I scan quickly through my pages to see if I, yeah? Maybe you can pick out the most valuable part. Yep, exactly. Ah, this one. <clears throat> okay, go ahead. So if you get a job offer from a company, that usually means they, they want to proceed into getting to the point where they make a contract. And people get nervous around that time. You know, even HR gets a bit nervous. It's a very official document, a job contract and a job offer. You'll see that the nerves around this whole period, they start going up. Don't be too scared about that. But I'm going to shift over to this famous word, negotiations, just to give that little nugget. How does that work? When it comes to negotiations about your package in the Netherlands, people feel very uncomfortable in general to start some negotiations. Well, don't be. It's quite common in the Netherlands, at least, or Western Europe, to do some negotiations about your salary. And people regard it as mature to do it. If you don't do it, you're an easy catch almost. But you have to feel all the time. And there's in the middle of the page somewhere a section where it says, if you feel you reach the bottom of the barrel, you have to stop. You have to think like a lawyer, I reached it. If I push it more, they will get annoyed in general. But this is the structure. You get a base salary. In the Netherlands, you get holiday money, 8% of your salary. You can always say, is that salary with or without the holiday money? There's something called 30% ruling in the Netherlands where you get the tax advantage. So these are the elements that you must understand. And there's some bonus stuff and a little joining fee that you can get. But I'll also tell you how you get a basis. You know, what's a good starting point for me to say, okay, I want to start talking about my salary. And for that, again, I will point you into the direction of the immigration services into European countries. Why the immigration services in many cases have defined benchmarks salary benchmarks that people must earn in order to qualify for these knowledge migrant work visas. And these benchmarks, of course, are known with the HR people. And of course, they know that they can negotiate down to that benchmark in order to offer contracts to people. So be wise, look up these benchmarks locally in a country from the immigration service and understand that that is the starting benchmark that you must know in order to make a realistic proposition. And I talk, of course, out of graduates, when you have more experience, you can up it, that's clear. But again, the benchmarks means that companies can get alternative employee suggestions closer to that benchmark if you go too high. Um, and that will give you a reasonable starting point. I think overall, what's best, guys, girls, never guess, never mention an amount that you guessed, hey, my buddy in Silicon Valley said he can earn this. It's killing for propositions. If you don't want to do it, if you don't want to guess, just say what you earned in your last job. Nothing wrong with that. That is totally normal. People will up it in negotiation and make sure that you get a little bit more and they understand you will not join if you don't earn more than your last job. Just be realistic about it. Don't second guess. And also take a bit of gutsy moment to go through some negotiations. Once it starts making you feel very uncomfortable and you're ready to accept, then at some point you need to accept as well. I can only say can candidates that go for a data science job in general, when you start negotiations, trust me, it's a very nervous, nervous phase that people don't generally want to do. Ask for some advice, then do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. It will be a bit formal and it will be a bit jumpy when you do this whole negotiation thing. Once it's signed, the contract is signed, you'll feel a relief and it's all gone again. But that last formal phase together with HR, that's formal, the candidate who negotiates is a little bit, you know, like 
uncomfortable as a phase. Last page. I'll just put it up while I maybe deal with some questions. This is the last one. This is just for reading while I'm dealing with the questions. I'm just leaving it up. It's got my personal details at the end, all those lovely resumes. Uh, but Robert, if there's any questions in the chat. Right um, someone is asking you if you can share the slides afterwards. Well, we will, we will arrange that if you, if, well, I'm not sure if you want. No, I, I thought about it, to be honest. Uh, guys, you're happy to have them. Don't start floating them around too much. You know, I'm giving inside tips on negotiations. Be reasonable, please. Use them to your own benefit. I don't want them to appear on the internet. Do you want people to approach your, you directly for this? or should we find we Yes. OK, great. So everyone, everyone know. Um, mm -mm -mm. Hey, let's see another question. Uh, someone is asking, oh, that's is this. Maybe I missed uh, this point earlier, but is it possible to send the CV to Casper? Yes, we know. Okay, what's the difference, Casper, in terms of questions in the different interview rounds? Hmm. Um, what's the difference in in a prepared or structured way of a company to approach the interviews instead of an ad hoc? A pragmatic way to approach the interviews. I think that's the more relevant question. You'll see that some companies have done the whole preparation of the interview rounds in a very organized way. Usually what's behind it is that they want people from the departments who already work there to have the opportunity to meet the candidates to see if they fit in. That's why they structured it. So the future peers, your future colleagues can get to have, they have a good look at you and can sniff you out. That's why you see that they've structured it completely. That's a sign that you are part of a department. When it's a little bit more pragmatic, you meet one person who asks you questions and then you're not completely sure what's going to happen after this, you'll see it's more dependent on working with that specific person. You know, you're being interviewed by that person, maybe even as an assistant or in his or her team specifically. So that's usually behind why it's structured or not. And, and the, the question to the answer, you know, what kind of questions can you expect? It all depends on this structured or unstructured approach to do interviews. So not one answer possible, sorry. Okay, thank you. And then there is a question about the, the, the slide, which is on the screen now. Uh, are you able to explain a bit more on the second point of the current slide? So European companies are definitely more academic style research orientated. Yeah, correct. What you see there is in general, you know, people, if they studied their, if they finished their studies, they want to continue a bit with their research work. You know, uh, I think the pre previous presentation also explained the difference between engineering and research. And in general, I think that even if you look at US firms that have, a, that have an office in, let's say, the Netherlands, they recruit people who can continue to do research straight from university, even in buildings next to the universities, they can continue to do research oriented work. So there's a little bit more freedom to determine the direction that you want to take when it comes to your research in the Netherlands in general. You see that culturally, it's slightly more determined in other regions, like let's say the US, and even if you do a request to go to a certain conference, it must be in your area, it must be related to a work product, etc. And then you get permission. In the Netherlands, it's an aim in itself to attend as many conferences as possible. Okay, I have a, a, a final question, uh, which is for myself, actually. Do you, um, if and how do you check the things which are in a resume? I mean, for example, I mean, you can write everything in, in, your, in your CV, of course. What are the ways uh, how you or maybe uh, recruiters in general handle this? Uh, are you checking things or maybe only uh, verifying things like yeah. what's being said is that true? Right. Hmm. Hardly, I'll be honest. So there's not, first of all, it's not considered to be done to go for checking without checking that with a candidate. You know, I'm checking things behind the back that's not considered polite. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a lot of trust that what's written down is actually true. You know, they will not go for references without telling the candidate I'm contacting a reference. It's actually not done. Yeah, sure. So in that sense, they are putting a lot of belief in their intuition, in their experience. 
and they will trust that during the talks, a candidate can fall through the cracks or not. And simple example, if I ask a candidate, you put C++ on your resume, which version? And they go, uh, 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 been a while ago. Beep. Yeah, right. right. So there is a few check questions. Uh, sometimes they're done jokingly, but sometimes they're also done to, to, to check a candidate. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Scott Square. It was very uh, a long and valuable uh, talk, I guess. Um, Who's all the people? Sorry? Did we lose all the participants? No, no, no. It was it was uh, running up. So uh, <laughs> no, that's good. Please, uh, if you have some time left, uh, because there are quite some questions, um, some open questions, but also some answered questions. Um, I guess you can answer them online, right? Yeah, you mean right? I can have a look at the chat. 